here we go. So sprint training, the essentials. This is what we're going to talk about. Now, before I get started, um, I will say something, which is that this is a free um, presentation. Now, this might be the point where you're expecting me to, uh, to ask for tips or something like that. I'm not going to do that. I do, I do not want you to pay me anything. If at the end of this presentation, you decide that it's been really good and you want to do something in recognition of that, rather than um, giving me money, you could donate to a cycling charity or you could take your expertise and your knowledge and you could help someone else who is struggling with their training. Uh, I would prefer those two things than that you try to give me any money for this. So with that said, we're going to move on to the first bit. Now, what is track sprint? Okay, this is our first question. There's a few sort of different answers to that, basically. I'm just trying to get rid of this. Let me get rid of that. So track sprint, basically four different disciplines, four different types of riding. Kieran, team sprint, the kilo or 500, and the match sprint. All right. Each of them has slightly different demands. Each of them is a you know, subtly different event. Okay. In the Kieran, you've got six racers who are all racing on the track at the same time. And they're led up to speed either by a derny, which is a little sort of motorized bike with pedals to finally adjust the speed, or by another cyclist. That's the sort of traditional way of doing it in Japan, uh, where discipline comes from, or just a big old motorbike sometimes does it. Anyway. The idea is that you're taken up to speed for a few laps. Uh, it's normally about 750 meters these days, and then you've got 750 meter sprint to the finish. So gradual build up of speed, and then bang, right for the finish, okay? Team sprint, uh, this used to be discipline for three male riders or two female riders. Uh, I don't know if they've actually changed it yet or not, but uh, changes in the works, so it is going to be three riders for men and three riders for women. You all start together, all lined up the track, and um, bottom rider in the gate, top two riders being held. On go, you set off. The first rider just does one lap with the other two riders behind them, peels off. Next rider does one lap on the front, peels off, and then the third rider does one lap on their own. Uh, and the first rider across the line, or fastest team to complete their three laps, is the winner. 500 meters or the kilo, very simple, individual event, full pelt from the gun, just cover that distance as fast as you can. Uh, I hate the fact that men ride the kilo, because a kilo is an unbelievably long way, and I deeply, deeply dislike it. I would much rather ride the 500, but unfortunately, I'm a man, so I've got to ride the kilo. And match sprint. Match sprint, um, two parts to that. First part is a 200 meter flying start time trial. So you get about 900 meters uh, total distance and the last 200 meters of that is timed. So you're building height on the track, you're building speed, and then you're coming flying down into this incredibly fast effort, uh, unless you're me, in which case it's quite a sluggish effort. And that seeds the riders. Then you take fastest rider, they race against the slowest rider, second fastest rider races the second slowest rider and so on. Then you go through your uh, quarterfinals, semifinals, finals, eventually you find your winner. Okay. And they're racing head to head over about 750 meters. So those are the events we're going to move on to now. We're going to say, what does a sprint session look like? You know, so you might be proper used to endurance training where there's lots of different ways you can do it but fundamentally you're on the track you're on the bike more often than you're off the bike now the thing about sprint session is that that's not the case the sprint session you actually spend most of your time off the bike that's because when you're sprinting you're stressing your body you're putting this enormous amount of effort this enormous amount of work in um, it completely floors you you're really you're just absolutely going to failure on it most of the time and that means that you need a long recovery in order to get um, those top end energy systems working. So in a two hour session, you will probably only do four, maybe five efforts, uh, maximum sort of 90 seconds duration, and you're gonna have a good 15, 20 minutes rest in between them. Sometimes it is even longer. So endurance, you're trying to build up, um, you sort of do long efforts, short recovery, another long effort. Sprint is completely flipped on its head, 
it's very, very short, very, very intense, and then a very, very long rest afterwards. Okay. You need that rest. If you can't, you know, if you feel after a couple of minutes that you can go again, essentially it means you didn't go hard enough. Uh, it's not an indictment on your character. It's not a sort of personal attack. It's something that riders who are crossing over from endurance or riders who are starting out in sprint often find quite difficult. The idea that you've really, you hit your peak power and then you don't sustain it. You're dropping off all the way through your effort, but you're trying to keep your legs turning despite them filling with lactic acid. Very, very different sensation, very different feel to anything that you would do in an endurance session. It really is a sort of very different type of, very different type of event. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that later on. But for now, we're going to say, what are the common features of each of the sprint events? You've got to accelerate quickly, you've got to go fast, and you've got to hold that speed for as long as you possibly can. I just see me reaching over us, just reaching for my notes. So, in general, the fastest rider wins. It's not always the case, um, but generally in sprint, the quickest rider wins. So if you're used to road racing, if you're used to track bunch racing, if you're used to anything like that, if you're a weaker rider, if you're a slower rider, then if you're tactically smart, if you're skillful, then on your day, you can get lucky and you can win, okay? Track sprint doesn't really work like that, unfortunately. Um, on the whole, you pretty much have to be physically the fastest rider. Um, there are things you can do, there are tactics you can use, but they're only really effective if you, two riders are very, very close in ability. You know, if one rider is significantly faster than the other, then it honestly doesn't matter what you do, um, the faster rider is pretty much going to win. So we've really got to do a lot of focus on the physical aspect of the training in order to make this work. Now, we're going to have a little look at how we go fast. Okay. There are three components when it comes to going fast. First one is aerodynamics and drag. How much stuff is holding you back? How much stuff is keeping you from being able to go through the air? Second one, how much power are you putting out? Okay. How hard are you fighting to try and part that air in front of you? How hard are you pushing? The third is how good is your technique? How can you, you know, how refined are you? Are you riding the shortest distance around the track? Are you in the right position uh, at the right time? Are you doing everything correctly? Okay. So basically the rest of this presentation is kind of going to split down into three parts. We're going to start off talking about aerodynamics. Then we're going to move on to talking about power, what that is and how you build it. And then we're going to move on and we're going to talk a little bit about technique. We're going to talk about some of the things you need to be able to do and um, the sort of the importance of those and some of the ways you can practice those things. All right. So moving on here, we've got two examples of aerodynamic positions. On the left here, we've got Matt Glatzer, who's an Australian rider, and he's very, very aerodynamic. He's um, used to hold, I think, the sea level kilo world record. It's a very difficult record to take. And then on the right, we've got Victoria Pendleton, who's a former British Olympic gold medalist. And again, a superb bike rider. The thing is, they are both products of their time. They're both products of aerodynamic development that was around when they were racing. This photo of Victoria Pendleton is from about 2008, I think. And this photo of Glatzer, I'm not 100% certain, but I think it is from the Gold Coast um, Commonwealth Games in 2018. So we've got two photos here that are about um, 10 years apart. Okay, so we're going to talk about what we can see in terms of aerodynamics from each of the two riders. Okay, now there are three things we need to worry about in terms of aerodynamics. Okay, first thing, how the air hits you. So when the air hits you front on, what does the air see? Okay, does it see a great big flat wall like that? Because that's not very aerodynamic. Or does it see something quite small, quite sharp? and quite pointy and something it can flow nicely around. Second thing, what does the air do as, as the air flows over you? Um, are there any bumps? Are there any things that are going to make it turbulent? Are there any things that are going to disturb that airflow? Thirdly, what does the air do when it leaves you? 
does it come together nice and smoothly or does it do so with a big crash creating lots of turbulence and lots of drag so i'm going to draw a couple of things on the screen now and we're going to see some of the little bits and pieces um, that we can think about in those terms so if we look at Mac Glazer here on the left, we're going to start out by looking at his forearms. You have a look at his forearms, you see how they've got that nice almost horizontal angle there. What that's doing is essentially removing his whole forearm from drag. The wind just isn't seeing it because it's not really there. Whereas Pendleton on the right has a much straighter arm. So that means that the wind is hitting her forearm a lot more. And the way Glates has done this, essentially, is just by having his bars slightly higher. So he's got a really good body position, but he hasn't achieved that. He's got a super low body position. You can see he's really far down on the bike. He hasn't achieved that by having his bars super low. He's achieved that by actually having his bars quite high, but by having that very, very steep bend in his arm. So it's a good way of demonstrating that not all positions are created equal. It's about how you achieve that position. Notice also, Glates's handlebars are very, very narrow. Okay, Matt Glates is a big man. Okay, but I would say here, his handlebars are probably about the same width as Victoria Pendleton's. Despite the fact I've met Victoria Pendleton, that she is tiny. She's really, really small. She actually had a subsequent career as a jockey, so she's very, very small, very, very slight. Um, but she's actually got a similar bike setup to this massive, massive guy she could probably have been a lot narrower and a lot more tightly pulled in like that. Some of the other things we can see in terms of the wind striking each of these riders, if we look at the heads, you'll see Glatzer has this very, very smooth, slick helmet with this integrated visor, whereas Pendleton has this helmet that has some little air vents in it. She's got these little side pieces here that will catch the wind. She's wearing sunglasses rather than a visor. All of those things are probably not going to be optimal in terms of aerodynamics. We can also have a little look at what the air is going to see as the air is moving over each of these riders. Look at Mac Glater's number pocket. You can see it's integrated into his suit. So there's no bumps. There's, no, there's nothing that's going to sort of make the air catch and flick up like that. Whereas if we look at Pendleton's number, you can actually see it's starting to flap up at the side. Not by much, but that is going to be catching more air than Glates's. And in a Flying 200, where they're often decided by tenths or hundredths or even thousandths of a second, every tiny little thing you can do makes a difference. Last little thing we're going to talk about. Glates's head is entirely shielded by his body. Okay, His head, in his position here, has absolutely no aerodynamic impact, or very, very little. Pendleton's head, on the other hand, is actually sticking up above her back. And what that means is the air, as it flows over her helmet, is not then going to flow nice and smoothly over her back, as it would for Glatzer. It's actually going to create this little turbulent pocket here, just behind the tail of her helmet. And that's going to have the effect of creating drag. So I want to make, want to make it clear, this is nothing to take away from Victoria Pendleton. She's a wonderful rider, she's a wonderful person, but aerodynamics has come a long way in 10 years. And these are some of the little things we can pick out that are some of the changes you can make. So actually, as a result of doing the research for this presentation, um, I'm gonna move my handlebars up because I've actually, when I ride, I've got very, very straight arms. I've realized that from looking back at photos and videos of myself doing efforts. I'm gonna try and be a little bit more like Matt Glatzer. I'm gonna try and move my bars up and I'm gonna try and get the same body position but with those bent forearms. So I'm gonna try and conceal all of that area there from the wind. Now I'm just gonna have a little check and see if we've got any questions or any chats because I can't actually see. So we're gonna move on now. We've talked in general terms about the aerodynamics. We're now gonna have a little look at the, um, the whys and the wherefores of this. So before I move on to the next slide, I'm gonna say, don't panic, okay? Don't switch off. This bit is not as bad as it seems, okay? Uh, apart from the fact that all my squiggles are still on the screen, which I hadn't realized was going to happen because as uh, we've established, I am brilliantly superb at this. <coughs> so here we have some aerodynamic equations, okay? Now, 
this might seem initially quite scary okay a lot of people don't like the mathematics that's involved with this but it's actually quite simple because a lot of these terms a lot of these things we have here are not super complex a lot of them simplify down and a lot of them are you know tend to remain constants so i'm going to tell you a little bit about what they are and about what we can do and how we can understand them to make it more efficient make ourselves more efficient so bring up my annotations again here fd that is total drag force so that's what you're fighting against and at sprint speeds that's that's really big that's the main thing you're pressing against okay cda that is a constant for a rider okay um it basically is a number that indicates how aero you are smaller the number the more aero you are so a really really aero rider is going to have a very small cda um a rider who's not very aero is going to have a much bigger cda uh takeaway is that's just a constant okay this little symbol here this is called rho and that is the air density air density is higher at sea level it's lower at altitude um, it's also affected by temperature so air density gets lower when it's humid and it gets lower when it's hot <coughs> so your ideal situation is a hot humid day at altitude and your nightmare situation is a cold dry day at sea level that means the air is going to be super dense and it's going to mean it's really difficult to push through so we've got our constant our cda we've got our rho um, air density again that's a constant constant on any given day okay the thing that changes mostly when we do this sort of thing is our speed and speed is indicated by this v squared term here now what that means is that your drag goes up four times if you go twice as fast uh, we call that an exponential increase so instead of your drag just going up in a nice straight line like that as you go faster your drag is going to do something like this so as you go faster it becomes much more difficult to go a tiny little bit faster the example i've given here it's really easy to go from five miles an hour to ten miles an hour because your drag value is very very small we're only in you know this sort of area of our graph here okay so if we're here and we multiply our drag force by four well probably still only there okay it's not really significant when we go from 20 miles an hour to 40 miles an hour at 20 miles an hour we might be in this part of the graph and if you multiply that by four god you're up here somewhere okay so it suddenly becomes an immense amount harder and what this means in terms of aerodynamics is the faster you go the more important aerodynamics become okay so if you can make a tiny tiny little change to your setup to your bike to your position um, you might not notice anything at 20 miles an hour at 40 miles an hour 45 miles an hour 50 miles an hour if you're a top professional it starts to become really really significant and really really important and one of the interesting things that comes out of this you always have to balance your aerodynamics against your power production against how much force you can actually put through the pedals sometimes and this will be more true as you go faster and faster you actually have to adopt such an extreme such a crushed aerodynamic position that it will start to reduce your power output but if you're going fast enough the drag reduction benefits might outweigh that that's quite an individual thing um, but it is something you need to bear in mind because it is something that can happen a um, good example of this is if you watch the berlin 2020 worlds world championships you'll see the guy harry lovrason who rode the fastest 200 meter time he never got out of the saddle for his main effort he actually did his whole effort in the saddle because he was going so fast he was hitting 50 miles an hour yeah he could have put out more power if he'd stood up out of the saddle but it would have been he would have been so much less aerodynamic that he would actually have gone slower so it's um it's a tricky balance you need to be aware that balance is there um and that it's going to be different for everybody now we're going to move on in a second it's my dog yelping for god knows what reason um let's see he's an annoying little boy he's fine though isn't he um, why don't you why don't you come here he's fine so we're going to move on a little bit to our next slide back to where we were 
talking about putting it all together. Okay, aerodynamics is only part of the picture. Um, there are other things as well. You've got rolling resistance from your tires, and you've got lots of little inefficiencies. You've got flex in the frame. You've got um, what? You've got a couple of watts lost from your pedal bearings. You've got um, you know just lots of little tiny bits and pieces together. Now. The thing with those, some people get super, super hung up and they get ceramic bearings in their bike and they get all these sort of fancy lubricants in their chain and so on. But the truth of the matter is that these other forces, these little forces, are either very, very small and very, very minor, or they increase linearly. So what that means is that if you've got um, three watt inefficiency at 100 watts, it might only be a four watt inefficiency at 500 watts. Okay, so yeah, it will go up, but it will go up by a very, very small amount. Um, the reason we put so much focus on drag, it's not that these other things aren't there. It's not that there isn't friction from the chain and flex in the frame and friction from the tires and so on. It's that all of those things are more or less constant, whereas drag that goes very steeply up very quickly. So that's why we spend most of our time trying to address that. Okay, there are things you can do. Um, there are things you can do to reduce the other sort of um, other forces. If you've got um, tires with tubes in, you can use latex in the tubes. They're a bit quicker. Um, you use a bigger chain ring on the front and a bigger sprocket on the back so the chain doesn't have to bend through such a tight radius. That's been shown to make a difference. Um, you can have very, very fast race tires, which are very, very thin and very, very light. So there are things you can do. Um, but the big one you want to do is reduce your aerodynamic drag. Uh, that's the thing you put most of your effort into doing. 